friends and fellow astronomers. I'm Stephen Bentley. Thank you, Phil, for your, your previous uh, presentation. I'm a uh, qualified electronics and design engineer. I'm retired. And um, I'm also from a background of radio frequency design. I've had several careers on the Philips, with Optus, and uh, I've now still got, got my hands in in the world of physical work and electrical design work for the activities of the uh, ASB. So I'm going to talk tonight briefly about the building of our radio telescope, which was a monumental project. And along the way, I'll mention some of the key players that were involved in the, the project. This, I'll begin with this man here, Mr. Clint Jeffrey, who was a radio ham, and he was a section director for the radio astronomy section for 12 years. And the project of building the dish really began with him. Um, he was also <coughs> the one that set up that radio laboratory that Phil showed you, the uh, shipping container, and many other projects. We really didn't have a lot before Clint came along. So a lot of that started with Clint's effort. And Clint also convinced the ASV to build a substantial radio telescope. So in many respects, it began with this particular man and his efforts. The actual dish itself is a, a product from a company in the United States out of Massachusetts called the, the, the Kennedy Company. And it's described as a 28-foot diameter dish, parabolic shape. It comes out of their catalogue from 1958 to 1961. And curiously, it's described as a mobile antenna. You might get some impression about that, these, these little strange structures here on the tower. The, the telescope, or the dish itself, the antenna itself, was intended for tropospheric scatter experiments, which is over the horizon communication. The useful frequency range of that eight and a half metre dish, based on its size and the, the, the characteristic of the mesh, the surface mesh, is about 400 megs to up to 10 gigahertz. And I'll explain in the next slide why it's described as a mobile antenna. It's built together like a, a Meccano kit, so all the bits and pieces of the dish itself fall apart into a smaller structure, which are designed to fit inside that tower, and the wheels become a trailer to be towed along. The uh, Postmaster General in Australia in the 1960s, which you know, ultimately became Telstra as we know them now, but the PMG bought many of these dishes and they used them for Bass Strait communication between mainland Australia and Tasmania to establish the feasibilities of those long distance radio links. When they uh, finished that development, the antennas became superfluous, so they put them on the market. And many radio amateurs saw them as a useful thing to buy for the radio amateur experiments. And one such example is here, owned by this man, Mr. Doug MacArthur. That's his call sign, VK3UM. He's passed away, sadly, but um, we didn't buy his particular dish. We bought one from another fellow radio ham, Mr. Rod Letts. He's also passed away, sadly, and uh, he lived in Ron Turner in Melbourne. And the ASV purchased this particular, a particular dish like that in February 2013. So you might argue that that's when the dish began its physical construction. Here's another key player in the, the project, Mr. Peter McGowan, a mechanical engineer, now retired. But back then, on the 20th of May, he was still employed, but he's a member of the ASV, and he offered up his mechanical design expertise to develop the tower structures to control the motion, motion control of our dish. And uh, this is a rather historic photograph that I took from the ASV's club rooms in Para Street in Burwood. And he's explaining his design concept for the control of the dish to the rest of our radio astronomy section, which was a great evening. We had several sessions like that. Peter's, there's a couple of Peter's design drawings. There's his name down there, July 2013. So Peter started fleshing out very significant details of his plan in pencil and paper. And there's another design there. And uh, he based it on an altitude azimuth configuration, very similar to the Parkes radio telescope, with a motorised lead screw, that's that jacking screw there, to do the altitude adjustment, and a turret uh, motorisation to do the azimuth. And the tower was to be a substantial structure, one metre in diameter, six millimetre thick steel, uh, bolted to a 
a bolt cage that was suspended into a, a concrete foundation, quite a substantial foundation. Peter um, designed the wood loading of this structure as if the dish surface was solid. So we've got significant margin in the wind loading characteristics of the, the dish. Peter took his design calculations, which was all the stress loadings and so forth, to his company and he had it independently reviewed by the, the fellow in staff that he worked with and uh, they signed off on the design independently. So that was another a due diligence process that Peter went through. Peter's uh, hand-drawn sketches were then later converted to some very nice, substantial computer-aided design drawings by another ASV member, Eddie Vandenberg. And this, this is just a couple of his drawings of that particular CAD process. Here's another interesting uh, snapshot that I took. Well, someone took it. Yeah, I, I, I didn't take it. Someone must have taken it. Um, it captures quite a number of other key players that were involved in the project. There's myself, of course. Uh, we had Robert Arrowsmith in the background. He was also a section director of the radio astronomy section. And he's been on the scene for many years. He was involved in the early stages of that radio astronomy section build-up and, and a lot of the project we have today. And he also assisted in the development and building of the dish. A lot of, lot of hands-on work from Rob. Uh, the man in the middle, Mark Zaccaro, he's our current ASV club president. But at the time of the building of the dish, he was um, greatly engaged with the Bendigo City Council, dealing with all the planning applications for the foundation and the, the permits to build the actual tower. And that took something more than a year to organise. Um, it required also soil samplings and a whole lot of reports to be generated as you can imagine, with planning purpose. And here's another two key players that I should mention. Uh, Chris Rudge on the left and uh, Ken Lamarckman on the right. Ken was the um, club president at the time when we purchased the dish, and so he had to approve of the sign-off of the expenditures. Um, so I've, I've noted, you know, made a note that he was a significant player at the time. Uh, Chris Rudge later became club president, but also during the process of the... Uh, development of the telescope, he was vice president, but he had a lot of effort involved in the, the companies that we sought to do the de manufacturing of the tower and the mechanical parts, so he was a great driver of that side of the development. Thank you to Chris and Ken. To, to do our due diligence, right at the very beginning, in 2013, I helped prepare this system specification a five-page document, which was then ultimately signed off by myself, Peter McGowan, the mechanical engineer, and Clint Jeffrey as the radio section director. Um, this was done so that we specified what we wanted the telescope to look like, its electrical mechanical specification. And this is just one page of five, as I mentioned. The document included compliance with all the appropriate Australian standards electrical wiring, mechanical uh, configuration, and occupational health and safety. Now this diagram here is a, <laughs> a block diagram of the electrical control system for the motorisation of the telescope. I won't dwell on too many details here. There's a couple of things that I wanted to mention, that there's two computer systems, the workstation, and another computer system here that is dedicated for the sole purpose of controlling the motors. So it's a two computer system. This one's got the uh, planetarium software and there's a need to communi communicate between this computer of course and the motorised control <laughs> computer and that's where another key player came in and uh, he's here tonight. Thank you Craig for your great work. Craig Boyd who's our uh, Linux expert and helped prepare that communication and uh, a very valuable contribution by Craig. This is the uh, power cabinet that shows you the control system for the motors on the telescope. There's the com main computer that does all that dedicated motorization control. And the, uh, the equipment here is these the altitude and azimuth uh, boxes that go directly to the motors. And they're called MoviTrack devices. And they come from a company called SEW Eurodrive. And We've used all of their products, the motorised control system, plus their motors and gearboxes. 
and uh, they gave us great support. They have a factory out at Airport West, I think it was, in Melbourne. Factory and uh, offices. Um, Phil and I spent time there with some training exercises. And when we finally built the telescope, they had a great deal of ongoing support, particularly with Phil, getting all the software bugs sorted out. Uh, although they have that company in Melbourne, their parent company comes out of Germany. And uh, Phil designed this cabinet and all the appropriate equipment that we needed in it. And, uh, but it had to be constructed by a qualified electrician. And that's where Mr. David Rolfe came along, another member of the ASV. Obviously, all of these volunteers devote their time and effort to construct something like that free of charge. So, another great key player in the group. So, it begins the construction. Here's the, an image, a historic image, of where we start to build <coughs> get the foundations for the concrete slab. That happened on the 27th of January, 2017. And in April of that year, you can see we're now ready to pour the concrete. The, um, the hole has been dug. This is a bolt cage and the ends of the studs, the threaded ends of the studs are above that ground level so that you can mount the tower onto that. The, uh, the bolt cage anchors into the concrete slab as you can see and then there's these orange conduits which go up inside the tower and also into each side wall of the foundation. That's where we've probably over-engineered this, but uh, we can, and we did, <laughs> to, to allow for all sorts of possible cabling. And um, so that's what, that's, that's what this is for. There's also a bit of a, uh, a dig out in there so that these conduits protrude past where the slab would have been. Over-engineering is good. Yes. It allows for upgrades. So about a week later, maybe a bit longer, 8th of April, 2017, same year, the beginning of the pouring of the slab. Another significant moment took place and uh, there's a whole lot of video, <laughs> endless hours of video and uh, still photographs. I'll just show you this one. It took three cement trucks worth to, to pour the cement and that's about 23 cubic metres and that's a total of about 55 metric tonnes of concrete once it's set. I prepared this diagram which is part of a uh, as-built documentation package we're putting together and uh, it shows you a plan of the, the site. You've seen the photographs that Phil put up earlier. So you've got the radio lab over there, this is north to the left and that's the compound where the dish is. So it's showing you the extent of the underground earthworks that's involved and the orange lines are obviously conduits that go between the where those, uh, the outside the concrete slab we have these four pits, access pits that are below ground. So the conduits come out of there, three of them head over towards the lab. One of them here is for the main AC power that powers the lab as well as power up into the uh, motorised control system for the dish. And the other two are for radio cabling and optical fibres and whatever. The one on the south side doesn't have <coughs> any uh, electrical connections to it yet, it's a spare. You'll also see these um, blue conduits coming out of the pits and that's for water drainage. Um, on that eastern side of the compound there, we've got this drainage channel that regularly floods and drains away the property. So that's where we drain off any excess water. And it's worth showing you now a cross-sectional detail of a typical drainage pit. I think it's interesting to see these sort of things, the trouble we went to. Um, so on the left you can see one of those underground conduits that come out of the pit and this is where cabling would go up into the tower. On the other side, the cabling would come from the uh, radio astronomy laboratory. And as you can see, there's a general rise in height of that. So we're about 1.3 metres below the surface here. And eventually that comes out at the surface at our radio lab. So any water that would appear into that conduit will eventually drain back into the pit. And below the pit is a sump. And so water in the bottom of the pit will then have another path. That's those water pipes. This is the 90 mil water pipe with a downward slope towards that water channel to take the water away from the pit. In case that ever silted up, which it has sometimes done, we've got a secondary drainage path, which is this screenage layer based on large size stones, typical sort of thing. And uh, that 
is it enables another secondary path for water to drain away. So far, we've never seen these things with water remain in for very any length of time, have we thought? So the drainage system appears to work quite well. And to put it into perspective, there's a picture of myself standing inside one. I think I've got a, a draw cord on there, so we're at the stage where we're starting to pull some cables through. And that's a, looking down into one of the pits. You can see the conduits and the sump at the bottom and the uh, water drainage pit. And these are quite substantial structures and they're quite deep, totally about one and a half metres deep. They were all dug out by hand, by volunteer labour, yeah. mostly this man. <laughs> <laughs> he also prepared a lot of the timber floor work and also mixed the concrete, poured it in the, to f f create those pits. Quite a substantial physical effort, but there were many other vol volunteers helping as well, wasn't there? For yeah. Now, we've also gone to a lot of trouble to think about the potential of lightning striking our tower. Even though we heard today that the Great Parks Telescope has never been hit. No, lightning was too scared. <laughs> <laughs> so we've done our best to sort of put due yeah. diligence and consideration of the possible yeah. scenario where it, it would hit. And by the way, our property at Heathcote is Lightning Alley. Storms that come through Victoria seem to go right through that central part. So we're not kidding when we try to do this. We've got a spike at the top of the, the, uh, the dish. And there's a conductor down the side on one of the struts. There's conduction through the tower itself, the dish itself. Then we've got quite substantial, really robust uh, electrical conductors around all these moving parts. And then the tower becomes a conductor itself. And then at the bottom we've got very, very large and thick, expensive copper earth straps that come off the bottom of the tower in a symmetrical design. And that's <coughs> from the theory of uh, how you do electrical lightning protection. You have to do a symmetrical design. So those earth straps then ultimately kept connect to underground earth mats to get the best connection to the ground we can get, as well as typical earth copper ground stakes. So far, I don't think we've ever been hit by lightning. There are trees much taller than our dish, and they probably get hit first. So during 2018, so we're now into the next year, the uh, tower has been constructed at a factory in Tullamarine in Victoria, and this is quite close to the end now. The tower is actually made of multiple sections that are welded together, and you know the end flange fitted and so forth. So we're seeing that the closing stages of production of the tower in Melbourne. Then we come to the stage where we're finally fitting the tower to the concrete slab, and that took place in late November, um, 2018. And uh, with all the substantial studs around the base of the tower there, the flange to the concrete slab, we had to, in fact, get a special one metre long spanner to do all those things <coughs> and them, talk them up properly. Uh, and here in this slide I've shown another key player in the project, Mr Greg Walton, member of the ASV. He's a retired mechanical fabricator. Um, at the time he still owned and operated his own private workshop with all machinery in it and he volunteered to help fabricate a lot of the mechanical parts of the, the tower, namely all these white bits up the top. Some items, some of these large plates he had laser cut externally but he drilled them, did a lot of the fine work in his own workshop and uh, some of these extra little hinge points and gears and so forth, Mr Greg Walton was involved in that. Now, once we got the tower in place, we then had to get access to all those underground conduits through the pits. So, some, as Phil mentioned earlier, trench digging, trench digging. Fortunately, we didn't dig them by hand. A lot of that was done by a backhoe, I think, digger. But the hand labour came in by installing all the drainage pipes, the screenage layer that I talked about in that pro profile of the, tri of the pit. Uh, all the conduits, and then there was hand labour to put all the soil back in and backfill it all. And uh, some of this work here you can see was done in December 2018, hot summer weekend. Loads of volunteers pouring their effort in and doing that kind of work for us. Then the momentous occasion to fit the dish to the tower itself, that took place in the following year, 25th of February 2019. I've put a couple of figures up there. The dish 
including, say, the receiver that we've built, the neutral hydrogen receiver, if that was fitted to the dish, the total weight is about 800 kilograms, and the total weight of the tower, 8,500 kilograms. Now, if you ever plan to build a telescope of this size for yourself, here's a rough estimate of what it might cost you. Just answered the question I was going to ask. <laughs> so uh, I'll put a summary here of the sort of things that we've had to spend as an ASV uh, non-profit organisation. $18,000 for that slab. Tower, motors and electricals, I'm drawing them all together, close to $100,000 worth there. We got the telescope dish quite cheap because it was second hand and Mr. Rod Letts, the amateur, was quite happy to sell it to us for that price. The cheapest item. Yes. <laughs> The neutral hydrogen receiver was very expensive. That came out of the uh, United States, $8,000 for that. So $120,000, but I don't know what price to put on all that many, many hours of volunteer labour, but it certainly was substantial. More than double. The dish, as a mechanical working system, was launched by the Right Honourable Ted Bailey, former Victorian State Premier, on uh, the, 20th, the 2nd of March, 20. 19, that was our messier star party up at Heathcote. We have several star parties throughout the year. This is the one we have in March. At that same date, we also launched a 40-inch optical telescope that we have up there. So, and that was Alan Finkel who cut the ribbon on that telescope. 40-inch? 40-inch. And one metre. One metre. Wow. 40-inch optical telescope. When you're down that way. Just How much did that cost? <laughs> yeah, that's, 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 that's a lot cheaper. Cheaper position. There's a building close to 100, but a lot of man animals do. So then came the time to fit our neutral hydrogen receiver. That was quite an effort to develop a mechanical assembly that would hold the receiver front end and the feed horn, and that was a, a construction designed and fabricated by Bill. And another key member of the project, Mr. Mitch Wright, who was here this evening. Thank you, Mitch. And uh, we hired a sizzle lift that day to fit it to the feed point, and that was done in late 2019. And we had to celebrate when the final system worked, and we were actually receiving neutral hydrogen signals. And that took place at a star party, a Christmas star party at the country property there. In uh, late 2019, you can see Clint Jeffrey, and at the moment on the microphone, I think, is Phil Costigan talking about the telescope. So that was another momentous occasion. And this image here shows Phil, sorry, uh, Clint Jeffrey. He's reflected in the computer screen inside the radio lab, looking at the first traces of voltage coming out of our neutral hydrogen receiver. The neutral hydrogen receiver configuration is shown in this basic diagram. It's based on two parts of the front end up the top on the, on the antenna with a feed horn using a waveguide and a Kumar choke. And in the radio lab we have the back end of the receiver connected to a computer. At the time we had it running, it was a Raspberry Pi. I think we're now using a standard Linux PC. Yeah. And uh, this, all of this is streamed on the web, so that's how we can do remote access. Um, the original design had an optical fibre link here between those front end and back end. And uh, that worked for about 18 months. I can show you a, an image where the optical fibre was first connected up and we saw the laser light coming out. This is in the back end inside the radio lab, so we can see the laser light was working. So the receiver worked that way for about 18 months. It, sadly, it failed for some unknown reason. We still don't really know. And uh, we wanted to keep the show on the road, so there was a backup cable. Those, those conduits had got lots of spare things through them, which was great planning. And uh, we had a coaxial cable, so we replaced the system over to a standard. So, Steve, that, that is fibre in it. Have you checked to see they're not broken? Because they're pretty flaky. You have to be very careful. Now, what was finally diagnosed, John, was the transmitter from the front end. It failed. There's mm -hmm. nothing coming out of it. Now, another little drama we had along the way was uh, discovered by Phil Costigan during a routine maintenance program that we had on the dish. And uh, we discovered, lo and behold, that some of the local bird species there at Heathcote had decided to nest inside the waveguide. 
And that, that's about, I don't know, 400 grams of mud. <laughs> and the soil, the clay soil there at Heathcote, is highly metallized. Mm. So, so you had two problems. You would have detuned the resonator quite significantly. Plus you've got birds going in and out. <laughs> so I, I did a lot of experiments and I found that good old garden shade cloth was actually acceptable. Yeah. And it certainly stopped the birds from nesting in there. Another problem we had within the less than two years of operation of the neutral hydrogen receiver was some failures in the front end. The front end is, as you can see, there's foam insulation inside the box. And the design from that American company had a peltier cell to cool that internal chamber of the receiver and bolted onto the heat sink of that uh, peltier cell was a fan. And that fan seized up, broke it. So I looked at the whole configuration of this and decided that was not the good strategy to do. So a second fan was installed, which circulated the air inside the box rather than try to draw air across the fins, which was choking the inlet of the fan, and that's part of the reason why it failed. So far, this alternate configuration has not failed. Another thing we thought to do while it was out being serviced was to put a service monitor in there so we can see what's going on inside that box at the front end. And uh, I came up with this design using an Arduino Nano, and uh, that computer system there is able to measure the power supply, the voltage current, voltage and current and the internal air temperature of the receiver front end and the humidity and also that little fan so we can still see that that's spinning and uh, the, the results of that are actually streamed on the internet 24-7 uh, I can use my mobile phone and look into it from time to time to see that it's still working it's a great little system and it's been very successful uh, I'll just make one final note about that all of the terminations in and out have been RF bypass because this box sits up alongside the front end, and that's all up at the feed point of the antenna. So, we started using the neutral hydrogen receiver for the first time by myself in early 2022. And uh, I came up with a scheme where I could sit down at home at my workstation and uh, I used crude methods because we didn't have anything else available at that stage. So I decided I could create a grid, a two degree grid in this case. And I chose two degrees because the beam width of our dish at one at uh, hydrogen. Oh. Okay. The beam width of our dish at neutral hydrogen is about 1.7 degrees. So I did a survey where the measurement points were two degrees apart. We won't dwell on that for too long. So that's a two degree grid and uh, it's got nine measurement points along the x-axis and seven on the y-axis so that's 63 discrete measurements i needed to make manually had to move the telescope from one point to the next take a reading out of the receiver log it down in a spreadsheet <laughs> whatever move on and then there was a lot of post-processing of that data to come up with this manually created hand drawn using photoshop and what have you uh, color contour map of our constellation of the Southern Cross. So you can see the crux there and the coal sack. And uh, that has not yet been published in our club newsletter, but it will come out in the next edition, I've been told. So in the spirit of collaboration in our radio astronomy section, the data has been shared amongst our group. And Mr. Joe Mackey, who's here tonight, was experimenting with the Python programming language and he wanted to learn a bit more about it. So he took my data and found a way to reinterpret it and plot it as a continuous colour contour map. So this is Joe's effort where he took my measurement points at each grid and the software automatically interpolated that between values. And we get this lovely chart that Joe's done. Great work, Joe, and thank you for that. We need more of it. <coughs> Finally, I'll close off with a little bit more information about our radio lab. Phil's given you quite a bit of detail already. Um, there's some important things that Phil didn't cover, so I'll explain that. Our internals of the lab has got an air conditioner which runs 24-7, keeps the internal temperature of that room, which has got our computers on that rack, 
And at the other end, we've got a rack with the radio receiving equipment plus test equipment. That room is kept at 23 degrees centigrade, very much within one degree C. So it's quite a thermally insulated and very stable environment in there. <coughs> and wonderful to be in summer. <laughs> it never used to be like that, right? <laughs> no, it was a stinking hot yeah. shipping container sitting in the sun. <laughs> at the radio equipment rack, um, I've cut the, cut the rack into two parts. <laughs> this bit's on the left is the top half of the rack. And uh, we're trying to do our best to be scientific with the work we're doing. And this is a, an instrument that I helped put in the, into the system. That's a off-the-shelf Hewlett-Packard GPS-disciplined reference clock and master oscillator and one pulse per second time reference. Uh, I bought this box underneath which fans those signals out, the 10 megahertz signal and the one PPS signal out, fans that out into a 10 outlets so that we can start adding other experiments and synchronise them to that time reference. This uh, device has a GPS satellite antenna on the roof, of course, on the shipping container. And uh, the specifications for that Hewlett-Packard box, if you're getting all the satellites, it can stabilise the time reference and that one, uh, sorry, 10 megahertz oscillator to 10 to the minus 12 error. If you lose the satellites for any period of time, Inbuilt programs in that device knows what to do to correct for those errors. So the worst case you would see is 10 to the minus 10. So it's not a bad thing. We, we should be time stamping all of our measurements and then we can correlate that with possibly the professional astronomers. Below that is the, the back end of the neutral hydrogen receiver <coughs> that we've talked about earlier. Uh, and then there's some other wonderful things that the club has just recently acquired. They, 26 gigahertz frequency counter. So there's no excuse for us not to be able to develop equipment that will work to the full extent of our dishes capabilities, up to 10 gigahertz. And below that is another wonderful instrument, an Agilent S-parameter for a two-port network analyzer that goes up to three gigahertz. I think you can understand the significance of that. That should got one installed in there. <laughs> now, this is second hand, it's several years old, it still works extremely well because the Hewlett Packard and Agile manufacture these products to very high standards. That will do lots of things for us, it will help us measure uh, the tuning of an antenna. We can develop filters, amplifiers, and you're getting a laboratory grade assessment of that equipment. And, um, when I worked at Phillips in my first career, the, we had one of these and it was worth $100,000 back in the 1980s. You could have bought a house for that. Mm. So the other thing we've done, at the vest of the entrance, when you step inside the shipping container, <coughs> we've got a, a Faraday cage with a proper a beryllium copper fingers around the door, a proper lockable door to really seal that off. Next to that, we have our gland plate. And we're doing our utmost to sort of allocate positions on the gland plate, label them properly, cable trays that go outside the lab. So we try to do things to high standards of construction. That'll be it for me before I close. Uh, you can see that the project took from 2013 to when we started getting assessments of neutral hydrogen. That was a span of about six years. But there was things earlier than that, and because uh, the research to find a suitable dish before we bought that second-hand one went on for several years too. Um, however, that six-year span was the project itself. We've still got lots to do. We've got to really tidy up our receiver a lot more, and uh, there's a lot of exciting things that we've learned today that will help us do that. So I'd like to thank all the volunteers who helped along the way and my sincere apologies to any key player that I might have forgotten. <laughs> Thanks very much, John. So it goes to show that if you've got big ideas, meticulous planning, uh, what, a heap of expertise, uh, a lot of grunt work, plenty of volunteers, 
and a lot of enthusiasm. You can achieve great things. It's very impressive. Thank you very much, gentlemen.